Hello, my name is Gloria Masters and this is my story on how I overcame 16 years of child abuse and trafficking. I was born in a western suburb in Auckland, New Zealand. I was the youngest of four children. I was a happy, inquisitive child. I loved exploring and I was always a bit cheeky, which I still am today. My childhood could have been, should have been safe and treasured and beautiful. But unfortunately, I was born into a, a family where child trafficking was the norm. My definition of that is being given to, rented to or leased to groups of men and other adults at times for money or goods and services. From the time I was born, really, my father was abusing me. That then extended to family, friends and other groups. And my grandmother, his mother and one of his sisters were tasked with the responsibility of teaching me about how to be the best child worker I could be. The first at the hands of my father occurred when I was four years old and he took me out in the car and it was just him and I and he said that if I was very good and did everything he told me to he would buy me an ice cream later and I remember thinking that was great because we never had ice creams or treats really in our family. And so I got in the car and we went up to this reserve behind uh, the area where where we lived. And it was there that the first began. And I remember what I was wearing. It was a little black and white dress with a, back in those days. It was a little lace collar and it had daisies on it. And I remember him pushing me to the ground and me. My mother was complicit in that her absence spoke volumes. She was a classic narcissist. He was your classic psychopath. She was not present, even if she was present, if that makes sense. At the age of five, my father drove me to my grandmother's house and he said it was going to be a very special time for me and that she was going to teach me some things. When he then delivered me to her house, she took me into her bedroom and shut the door and locked it. And I turned around and faced her and said, what are we doing? I don't understand. And she said, you will do what you are told, otherwise there will be trouble. And then she told me how I was to try and perform in a manner so that daddy's friends could have some fun with me and pay him more money. She started parading around and showing me moves and how to look at men and how to men and where to put my hands and I was required to mirror her and reflect what she was doing. If I didn't get it right, she would slap me across the face. One of the first times I remember going to a party where my services were being paid for was at my father's home where he had some friends come in and they each had a card in their hand and they were numbered. And what they had done was draw a number out. And that meant the order in which they would me, abuse me, hurt me. I think my father, from when I was quite young, had realised I needed to be because no one wanted to pay money for a traumatised and terrified child, and I was. I was both. I would be uh, put into a van and taken to Freemasons once a month 
there there would be other children satanic ritual abuse would take place so there were many men there and i'm not saying every freemason was a pedophile but i'm saying at certain levels throughout their hierarchy they were doing this that went on we we're now moving i'm getting closer to 10 years of age now my behavior was out of control at school. I was so traumatized. I was screaming for help. The teachers didn't know what to do with me. I was sent out of the class more than I was in it. I was strapped continuously. I was punished continuously, but it was the only place I could be me. No teacher ever asked what's going on. And as I uh, reached the age of 11, my parents lined us up in the living room and said, we are ending our marriage. You need to choose who to live with. So anyway, he offered me a horse if I stayed with him. So I said I would. There was never going to be any horse. There was never going to be anything. Uh, so I stayed with him and that's where my nightmare began and that's what my first book is about. It's those those 18 months I got left with my father and brother. I tried to take my own life three times during that 18 months living with my father and brother. Not only was I abused, abused I was physically abused, I was thrown against walls, I was stomped on, kicked, smacked around. I was psychologically tortured. My abusers were mainly men, but there were women involved. And I was leased out of uh, an Auckland nightclub, which is uh, in our K Road, our red light district in central Auckland. I was leased out of the top floor of that, and I remember it, I was chained to a bed. The beautiful um, women working there, and there were some transgender um, people there as well, would look out for me, and they were horrified. They didn't like my father. I was an 11 and a half year old girl, very thin, very underweight, and clearly didn't want to be there, but they would sneak me in food and something to drink, and they looked out for me. But it was at that nightclub that men and sometimes women would come in to abuse me but I was novelty you see I was the only child being leased out of there at the same nightclub during the day um, some weekends I would be on the stage with other children or maybe another girl or another boy and we would have to perform for and with adult men and sometimes adult women and this was all being filmed. I would have been 12, 12 and a half. I remember thinking, what is the point in calling out for help? There is none. The filming that took place would be during the day and would go on for most of the day. This was all filmed and these, these were made into copies and then sold to other interested parties throughout my father's pedophile and underground rings. There is a myth out there that the abuse that I suffered must have been from lower socioeconomic, um, impoverished uh, sectors within New Zealand, 100% false. This was across all sectors of society, and I understand it's the same today. It was not specific in a group. Any and anybody would do that had money, that could pay. And the more acts I could perform, the more money they could make. My parents separated at 11. At the age of 12 and a half, I came home from school one day and... I saw my father in bed with another woman. That spun me into such shock because I was his mistress. 
in my childlike mind, I had become that for him. So I turned and fled and I ran up to my mother's house. And I think that's actually what saved my life because she rang the priest and the priest said, he is committing adultery, you need to remove her from the home. So I went and lived with my mother, but she decided she didn't really enjoy having me there. So very quickly she decided that I would have to go back to him every second weekend. So from the ages of 12 and a half to 16, I had 12 days of relative safety. And then I would have two days at my father's. It was actually more traumatic for me. He made sure that when I was with him, I earned every cent I could for every minute I was with him. The worst experience is one that I still remember vividly to this day. He leased me out to one of the gangs, money exchanged hands, and I was to be there for a 12 hour period. By the time my father picked me up the next day, I was unrecognizable. I was so traumatized, I should have been hospitalized. My father on arriving and seeing this said these words, to the gang leader. Mate, you need to be careful what you do to her, eh? She won't look as good for you otherwise. During that weekend, they had what gangs call put me on the block. And it was an initiation ceremony for a new blooded gang member, which meant their prize and their initiation was to do whatever they wanted to me to prove how tough they were and therefore to be acceptable into the gang. Now, because I was 12 and a half, maybe 13, but certainly early, early teens, I could see this man had something to prove and I decided to look away. I didn't want to see his eyes, but he had other ideas. Now, once he'd finished with me, they all lined up to have a go. Again, I was, but they couldn't quite shut out all of it. My grandmother, between the ages of 11 and 16, performed forced abortions on me. No one wanted me to be a pregnant teenager. No one was willing to pay money for that. So abortions were performed. My parents had a custody agreement that when I turned 16, I could choose whether to see my father or not. In other words, the custody agreement, the official custody agreement ended when I turned 16. The only times I ever saw my father once I turned 16 was at family weddings or funerals. I never ever willingly saw him again. My father was not a person to give up easily. He would continually ring the family home, demand to speak to me and try and manipulate me. My mother was complicit in that. She wouldn't even advocate for me or wonder why. Why would you not want to be with him or see him? I was very grateful at the age of 16 to never have to see my father again. However, what I wasn't so grateful for was the absolute train wreck I was. And it was at the age of 32, by then I'd had my second child, when the memories started flying and went and got professional help. But it still took decades of healing and workshops and reading and listening to professionals out there to try and find who was I? I had no idea that that beautiful little child who saw the light was somewhere in there. My therapist a year or so ago said to me, do you really think you went through all of that to do nothing with it? And she's right. It was in my early 50s when I realised I needed to do something and I went to a global development conference. I was just pulled to it and there were 2,000 people there and 
the group I was in had two trainers. There were about 60 of us in this group. And uh, on day one, the two trainers in charge of our group approached me and they said, Gloria, what an honor to meet you. We see you, we see your light. Uh, you can't hide this. And I think you should be talking at this conference, actually. Would you be prepared to do so? And I said, hell no. <laughs> I, I didn't see myself the way they saw me. I was still trying to lift my head up and look people in the eye about this trauma. But it was big in me, this truth, you see. I needed to speak because I knew there were other survivors out there as well. And I got up and spoke and I spoke through tears and I basically gave a quick synopsis of my 16 years. When I finally ended, it was silence. And I thought, oh no, um, this is too much for the audience. And then I raised my head and I could see the tears and the, the sadness and the absolute beautiful empathy. And then one by one, people started approaching. And one man came up and whispered in my ear and said, because of your courage today, I'm now finally going to speak about what happened to me. And so it began. And that is what lit the path. And it was at that place that I got asked, told, begged, please, please write your story. The name of my first book is On Angel's Wings, My Flight from Trauma to Grace. And what it does is it depicts a girl at 11 looking down, because that was me, and you can see the angel wings coming down around her. This is my second book. This is written for fellow survivors. It's Flight Path to Healing. I now run a channel and a charity called Handing the Shame Back. I think for people watching who perhaps are newly outed survivors, never doubt your beautiful selves. You, you know the truth. You will always be shoulder tapped. You will always hear your inner voice give you the guidance. So trust you. Secondly, if you want to share, start with someone that you really trust. That is that ride or die friend who would never let you down. Um, and finally, do some journaling. Sometimes what we hold in our heads and minds if we can release it onto paper, it can show us a clear way through. Thank you so much for watching this and listening to my story. I realize it would not have been easy and I tell my truth in the hopes that it will inspire and lift others to feel less alone and that they are believed. If you would like to follow my story and become part of the survivor community, please go to handingtheshameback.org and also follow the YouTube channel Hand in the Shame Back. The links are below to the books and if you would like to follow us on social media, Instagram tends to be the place to go. In the meantime, I see you, I stand with you and I believe you.